Hi, my name is Jeremy. I'm Eric. I'm Faiz. I'm Joao. I'm Jay. The topic of today's video presentation is the duty to disclose. The focus of this video would be to analyze as well as potentially challenge the relationship between misrepresentation as well as the debate on the non-disclosure non of facts and how it impacts the outcome of a contractual agreement. So firstly, uh, appropriate consent is an essential ingredient to any contractual agreement. So the question that arises is whether liability should be imposed on the party that is represented on the grounds of non-disclosure of material facts and how it, it develops during the negotiation of the contract. First and foremost, the Malaysian Contracts Act of 1950 laid down the essential groundwork needed for laws that define misrepresentation. So Section 14D of the Contract Act established misrepresentation as an element capable of inducing consent um, not given freely by the party that has been misrepresented. So moreover, in Section 18, misrepresentation was divided into three different types. So I shall quote it. The first one would be positive assertion in a manner not warranted by the information of the person making it, of that which is not true, though he believes it to be true. The second form would be any breach of duty which, without an intent to deceive, gives the advantage to the person committing it, or anyone claiming under him by misleading another to his prejudice, or to the prejudice of anyone claiming under him. And last but not least, the third one, which is causing, however innocently, a party to an agreement to make a mistake as to the substance of the thing which is subject of the agreement. So additionally, in English law, Ewan McKendrick he defined misrepresentation as an ambiguous false statement of fact made to the claimant, which induces them to enter the contract. Thus, it is safe to assume that both English and Malaysian law um, define misrepresentation, their, their definition of misrepresentation is fundamentally similar. When it comes to the duty of disclosure of facts of an agreement, no such duty exists within the jurisdiction of both the UK and Malaysian law. So an example would be the absence of a responsibility on behalf of a bank to disclose a more attractive rate of interest that is available in a different account to its client. This was the case of Surya, Douglas and Midland Bank. So the rationale behind this non-disclosure theory is that um, the it is a preference by the courts on behalf of the party lacking the knowledge to inquire, uh, inquire with the party that has the knowledge um, rather than imposing the duty of voluntary information on the representing party. So nevertheless, both English and Malaysian law recognizes that there are particular situations in which a duty does arise and this will be elaborated further by my friends. Thank you. Rescission is often available as a remedy for pre-contractual misrepresentation. It is not, however, a general remedy for cases involving non-disclosure. As seen in Smith and Hughes, fraudulent non-disclosure does not itself give right to, a, to the right to rescind. In other words, it is really not sufficient for the claimant to show that the defendant withheld information which, had the claimant known, would affect his decision to enter into the contract. Therefore, on top of this, it is essential for the claimant to show that the non-disclosure was in breach of a duty which the other party to the contract owed to him. This duty may arise by virtue uh, of the type of contract entered upon or by virtue of the relationship that exists between the parties to the contract. So you've talked about the obligation to disclose information. So what do you think are the types of contracts that would give rise to these duties? Generally, contracts that are uber rime fide or of utmost good faith carry the duty of disclosure. Although this terminology is firmly established, it is often criticised as unsatisfactory to distinguish whether the particular type of contract should carry the duty of disclosure. And if so, what is the content of the disclosure? So this uber rime fide doctrine, what do you think, what are the contracts that you think are categorised under this? The contracts that are categorized under this utmost good faith term um, cannot be extended as courts are inconsistent in their reasoning. At times, mm. court rule that the reason that a contract cannot be con classified as contracts uber rime fide is because there should be no duty of disclosure, as seen in Seaton and Heath. 
However, sometimes they have accepted some form of duty to disclose in certain contracts which are not contracts over remain be day, uh, such as uh, surety contracts and contracts uh, for the sale of land. Plus, then can we conclude that this term is unsatisfactory? Yes, this term Uber Remain Fide seems obscure as supported by the statement of Lord Mansfield in Carter and Bohm that the term is unhelpful and should be abandoned as it fails to distinguish between the duties of disclosure in the formation of the contract and duties of disclosure in the contract's performance itself. The legal system in England has not yet developed yet develop a generalised principle of good faith. Hence, the term utmost good faith seems unhelpful and unnecessary, at least as a tool to determine whether or not there is a duty to disclose information by the contracting parties. This issue will, further, will be further addressed in the later parts of this assignment. Alright, moving on, I'm aware that there are other types of contracts that give rise to this duty of disclosure, is that right? Yes, um, this type of contracts include insurance contracts. Parties to an insurance contract has a duty of disclosure towards the other in the formation of that contract and this duty extends beyond the formation of the contract which includes the renewal of an existing insurance policy as seen in the case of Lambert and uh, Co-Cooperative Insurance Society Limited. While this duty applies in all insurance contracts, the duty arises not from a term in the contract itself but as a matter of law and it is seen in the case of Pan Atlantic Insurance Co Limited that contracts of insurance are considered contracts Uber Reme Fide. So what exactly makes up this insurance contract? The question as to what is insurance contract is addressed by Lord Justice Romer in Seton and Heath, where contracts of insurance are generally matters of speculation. The insured has knowledge as to a risk and the insurer does not. The insured generally puts the risk before the insurer as part of the transaction and the insurer then fixes a price to remunerate him for the risk to be undertaken and the insurer is to pay the loss incurred by the insured in the event of a contingency. So it is the duty of the insured to disclose material facts um, that he knows or ought to know to the insurer because this in turn will influence the insurer's um, ability to either fix the contract or the premium and all that and consider whether or not they should take the risk. So what is this so-called material information and do they have the possibility of revision? Okay, in a sense, material information is the information that will have an effect on the thought process of the insurer in weighing up the risk and not disclosing this material information would have led to a prudent insurer either rejecting the risk or having it accepted on a more onerous term. Whether a particular circumstance or fact is material or not is a question of fact, uh, as expressed in the Statute Marine Insurance Act 1906. Whether either party to an insurance contract has a right to rescind in light of a breach in contract is subjected to the bars uh, to rescission which the party in breach may establish. I am sure you are aware of partnership contracts. Is there a duty to disclose information in those contracts? So when it comes to partnership contracts, it is assumed that prospective partners owe each other a duty to disclose information because they owe each other good faith and disclosure during this term of the partnership. However, the question is whether or not this duty is extended to pre-contractual negotiations. So uh, in the case of Bell and Level Bros, Lord Atkin assumed that an intending partner has a duty to disclose information and this um, judgment was further reaffirmed by Justin Lauren Collins in the case of Condon and Sims that prospective partners do have a duty to disclose material information. Um, so besides partnership contracts, I'm sure there's another type of contract that involves family arrangements and compromises between family members. Can you further elaborate on those type of contracts? So when it comes to family arrangements, in the case of tenant and tenant, it is said that duty of disclosure exists because uh, family arrangements are contracts Uber may fide. So when family members settle a dispute among themselves by contract, um, such as a division of property, um, it is held that in the case of Greenwood and Greenwood, that there must be full and complete disclosure of all material circumstances within the knowledge of the parties. Breach of that duty would lead to a possibility of rescission. 
However, um, it is important to know that courts are very reluctant to interfere with these dispute settlements uh, involving families as a matter of policy. So um, after this, there is the contract for the sale of land. What do you think about that? Um, so we previously mentioned this contract for the sale of land. As for this type of contracts, they are not contracts over Rene Fide, as suggested in the case of Safe Haven Investments and uh, Springbrook Limited. The seller under the contract has no general duty of disclosure and so has no duty to disclose things like defects in the quality of the property. However, the seller does have a duty to disclose latent defects in the title of the land. Note that this breach of, uh, of duty does not give rise uh, to a right to rescind of the, uh, to the contract at initial by the purchaser as seen in the case of Faruqi and English Real Estates Limited but acts as a contractual allocation of risk and as a defence to the seller's action for specific performance. For example, under the Housing Act 2004, the seller of a property must have in his position a home information pack when marketing the property and must provide a copy of this home information pack to a potential buyer of the property. On the other hand, the purchaser, the buyer of the property, has no duty to disclose in favour of the vendor as his position is the same uh, as a purchaser of goods, which is caveat emptor, which means that the risk the buyer takes when buying the property can operate to his advantage as much as to be his disadvantage. As discussed by my friends earlier, as the loss of contract stands in the UK and in Malaysia, there is no general duty which imposes a duty to disclose material facts. But then my part of the presentation would argue that there is indeed a duty by giving statutory examples which imposes liability for non-disclosure. One of the first statutes which imposes liability for non-disclosure can be seen in the Financial Services and Markets Act 2000, whereby Section 90 imposes liability for omissions from prospectuses and listing particulars. Uh, listing particulars is information used by companies which seeks admissions of new securities, whereas prospectuses is information, a legal document issued by companies that are off offering securities for sale. And then the Act imposes liability for bought losses suffered as a result of misrepresentation in prospectuses and listing particulars and also loss suffered as a result of omission. The general duty of disclosure in listing particulars is contained in Section 80 of the 2000 Act, whereby Section 80 states that listing particulars submitted to the competent authority under Section 79 must contain all such information as investors and their professional advisors would reasonably require and expect to find that. And Section 81 further states that if there is a significant change in the listing particulars, the issuer must submit a supplementary listing particulars of the change or new matter to the competent authority. If the supplementary listing particulars are issued but fail to include matters which are required by the general duty of disclosure, then Section 90 established that both the issuer who fails to issue the supplementary listing particulars and the person responsible who fails to notify the issue of a change, a liability to pay compensation to the victim who suffered losses as a result of the failure. The effect of Section 80 of the Financial Services and Market Act 2000 is that it imposes a general duty of disclosure of relevant information and that Section 90 established to the person responsible a liability in damages for loss caused by the non-disclosure. Now I'll be discussing other statutes which also impose liability for non-disclosure, such as the Consumer Protection Regulations Act 2000, whereby the Act provides that a person who supplies goods and services to a customer under certain types of distant contract is required in good time prior to the conclusion of the contract. The required information stated may include description of the main characteristic of the goods or services and the price, and failure to provide required information give the customer the right to cancel the contract within a period of time which is normally starts on the day of the contract made and ends seven working days day after or seven working days the day after the customer received the goods. It is significant to note that failure to provide required information does not make the contract void or voidable nor does it give the customer a claim in damages. 
But besides statutes which imposes, imposes statutory obligations for non-disclosure, there's also statutes which imposes criminal liability for failure to provide information. For example, Section, 3, 9, Section 397 of the Financial Services Market Act 2000, whereby it imposes criminal liability to, on a person who dishonestly conceals any material facts for the purpose of inducing another person into or exercise rights under an investment agreement or certain other specified agreements. And then the Package Travel, Package Holiday and Package Tour Regulations 1992 states imposes, also imposes, criminal liability on organizers for making consumers available to brochures which do not contain prescribed information about the package and on organizers and retailers of packages for failing to provide certain other information. In conclusion, referring back to the question, as far as the law stands in England and Wales, the stat statement providing the fact that a person is under no duty to disclose material facts known to him but not to the other party is only partially true as the general rule provides that there is indeed no such duty. Nonetheless, there is however an exception to this general rule with the additional of statute, existing statutory provisions which give rise to statutory liability for non-disclosure as I have discussed earlier. Hi, my name is Eric and today I'm a special guest with me, Jehang. And today we are here to talk about a duty of disclosure in Malaysian law and its possible reforms based on UK and Malaysian law. So Eric, what are your thoughts on the duty of disclosure in Malaysian law? I'm glad you asked, Jehan. Stimulus to that of England and Wales, Malaysian law states the party misled by a false representation cannot claim damages for a breach of contract as no terms of the contract have been broken. However, said party still may claim relief based on the law of misrepresentation and fraud. A misrepresentation is a false statement of an existing or past fact made by one party prior or during the making of the contract towards the opposing party that said statement made is to be true. However, the Malaysian Contracts Act 1950 does not use the term fraudulent misrepresentation, negligent misrepresentation, or innocent misrepresentation. But Section 8 defines misrepresentation to include the factors of a false representation. A misrepresentation being a fact, the maker addressed the statement to the party misled and the maker believes in the truth of said statement. Section 18 of the Contracts Act 1950 has been criticised widely by many, including Paula Kemula, noting the obscurity of subsection B being, quote, any breach of duty which, without an intent to deceive, gives an advantage to the person committing it, or anyone claiming under him by misleading another to his prejudice, or to the prejudice of anyone claiming under him, end quote. Or subsection C, being, quote, causing, however, innocently a party to an agreement to make a mistake as to the substance of the thing which is the subject of the agreement, quote, being easy to be confused with. In the case of duty of disclosure, in which a party to a contract actively conceals or withdraws certain material information from reaching the other party, his active concealment is said of said information amounts to disclosure. Section 17 of the Contracts Act 1950 had put forward that, quote, mere silence as to facts likely to affect the willingness of a person to enter into a contract is not fraud unless the circumstances of the cases are such that regard being had to them, it is to the duty of the person keeping silence to speak, or unless his silence is in itself equivalent to speech, end quote. Due to the fact that there is no statute in Malaysia law directed towards duty of disclosure, it can be assumed this section, while pointing towards fraud, extends to other types of misrepresentation. An example can be shown in the higher purchase case of Lao Hi Tua versus Hagio Engineering Sibirian Berhad, in which it was held that the seller, which is the defendant, had no duty to inform the hire, which is the plaintiff, about the year of manufacture of the machine and its previous accidents. Hence, it follows that, similar to that of English law, there is no general duty of disclosure in Malaysian law. Well then, are there any exceptions to the duty of disclosure in Malaysian law? Hmm. Yes. While there is a general rule that silence does not constitute fraud, there are indeed exceptions in which a duty of disclosure is imposed and there are contracts of uber fide, relationships of a fiduciary nature and those created by statute. With the main example being insurance contracts, based on section 150 of the English Marine Insurance Act 1996, there is a general duty of disclosure between both parties. 
the licensed insurer and the insured, in which either party must disclose all material facts and neither party must innocently nor honestly made any misrepresentation of facts to the opposing party. In Malaysia, the Financial Service Act 2013 had laid down a duty of disclosure for all insurance contracts. A case example being Nanjin Jiao and Alliance Life Insurance Malaysia Berhad and others. It was held that the plaintiff was entitled to his claim as there was a duty on parties to act with utmost good faith towards each other and it was the general duty of insurer and agent to make full disclosure of material facts. So, Jehan, are there any reforms you would like to propose in regards to the duty of disclosure? An excellent question, Eric. Well, first of all, I would like to state that the law regarding the duty of disclosure in Malaysia and the UK are exceedingly similar. Thus, any possible reforms will also largely be the same. Moving on, I believe that the present law regarding the duty of disclosure is generally able to satisfactorily protect the, in the consumer's interests by requiring a disclosure of relevant facts in specific circumstances while also ensuring commercial efficacy by refraining from imposing too severe a duty of disclosure upon businesses. Nevertheless, there is still one specific area of the law with respect to the duty of disclosure which has been found to be inadequate which is contracts involving insurance. Insurance contracts are special as they are built upon the concept of uberime fide and thus require full disclosure of material facts. Non-disclosure would then result in the contract becoming void ab initio even if there is a lack of fraudulent elements. So, why do you think these reforms are necessary? Well, the economic consequences for non-disclosure are inordinately harsh. The underlying rationale is unde undeniably sound, as this duty plays a prophylactic role against fraud, whilst also bolstering the furtherance of good faith. Moreover, certain critical information, which underwriters require to accurately assess the risk involved, may be peculiarly within the insurance knowledge and, difficult to, and is difficult to elicit. Despite these reasons, the severity of this duty has been widely criticised by modern judges in cases including, but not limited to, Anglo-African Merchants Limited and Bailey, and Lambert and Cooperative Insurance Society Limited. In fact, Lord, Lord Justices Lawton and Cairns have encouraged parliamentary intervention in addressing the injustices caused by the harshness, harshness of the duty. These criticisms are further compounded by the argument that the common law duty of disclosure was founded in an 18th century setting and has since become fairly obsolete. Modern insurers have access to resources immeasurably superior to their archaic counterparts and can easily obtain detailed relevant statistical data to examine claims and detect fraud. The only knowledge which still eludes an insurer is particular knowledge that the insured may have or be aware of in relation to the specific property or potential liability. This deficiency can easily be remedied by asking certain specific questions. Well then. Have these issues been addressed in any way? Well, the Law Commission of England and Wales as well as the Scottish Law Commission has recently published a joint consultation paper titled Insurance Contract Law, Misrepresentation, Non-Disclosure and Breach of Warranty by the Insurer. In this, in this paper, there has been pro proposals to bring the law into line with industry practice and ombudsman guidance by requiring insurers to ask clear questions regarding any material facts, and thus abolishing the consumer's duty of disclosure. In consumer cases, the range of relevant factors is adequately well known and foreseeable, such that the insurer can generally be expected to ask specific questions about most of them. And unusual circumstances can be addressed through a general sweeper question, which would impute a need to disclose facts regarding the unusual situation. It has been generally accepted as good practice that an insurer should actively ask questions regarding material facts and the Financial Ombudsman Services, which shall henceforth be known as the FOS, has been seen to refuse allowing an insurer to avoid a policy on grounds of non-disclosure where no questions were asked. The FOS has contended that consumers need not volunteer information which mirrors insurance practices in various other continental jurisdictions such as France, Nor Norway, and, the, and Sweden. Nevertheless, the acts in these, in these countries 
provide that the proposal has a duty to disclose facts that they know would be crucial or conclusive to the insurer. Therefore, it is clear that the duty of disclosure can and should be abolished, as it is outdated and places a disproportionate burden on consumers. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you, sir. In conclusion, our team believes that there is no general duty to disclose to a certain extent due to the exceptions that we have aforementioned. Besides that, we also believe that all the reforms that we have talked before should be implemented. Thank you! Thank you.